I was always really, really serious about riffing, since most of my favorite lead guitar players are also great riff players. And though some people might say that the approach on getting a good riff and rhythm guitar player is completely different than getting a good lead guitar player. And I say, deep down in the core, it's not. Hi Guitar Champion, I'm Justin Hombach, back from my practice cave and in today's video we're going to take a deeper look in one of the hardest metal riffs that I've learned so far in my career as a guitar player. I'm going to show you my approach on practicing this riff and why practicing this riff made me not only a better riff player but also a better lead guitar player. Here we go. So the riff that you've just heard is from the song Call of Valkyries from the band Eternity's End. I'm the second lead guitar player, the second guitar player of Eternity's End since one year. And around February and March actually a tour with Eternity's End was planned, but it sadly got cancelled due to Covid and due to the backlash of the pandemic. But still I have prepared for this tour three months ahead and I had a really really strict um, practice routine which really helped me a lot to see practicing guitar from a different kind of angle and learned a lot during that time. Because let me tell you something about Eternity's End which might be a little bit controversial. Eternity's End is the most craziest guitar oriented band that you have currently out there in power metal. The stuff that I had to learn for this band, most of the stuff was written by my band member Christian, and the stuff that I had to practice and to learn is totally insane. I guarantee to you, if you are a fan of technical power metal, shred, neoclassical inspired power metal, but with a modern sound, go check out the last record, Embers of War. Highly recommend it. And bringing this on the stage was really, really terrifying for me. I really had to prepare the shit out of it. Because I have the mindset, the better you can play a song here in the practice room, the better, of course, you can play it on stage. Of course, you will always lose some percentage on how tight and how good you can play a song when you're going on the stage. Because, yeah, on stage happens a lot of stuff. There may be bad sound. Um, you are nervous, adrenaline, all this kind of stuff can have bad results and have some sort of impact on your playing. But the more you are aware of your technique and the better you can play all this kind of stuff, the less impact I would say all these kind of factors have on your playing. It will still have some impact, but the amount of impact will be a lot less. The more you're practicing something, the more it gets into your muscle memory, you don't have to think about it anymore, and so you can focus a little bit more on performance and all that stuff that is happening on stage. I've experienced this, for example, with Megalife, my mega distribute band, and there I can say, Right from right from the get-go, I could play you the complete set with only the drums. I don't need to hear my guitar or the other guitar or the vocalist or the bassist because I have practiced all those songs so many times and so in detail that I can completely play this song on my own and it will be enjoyable to listen. Now, while I'm telling people how I practice for the Eternity's End Tour, some people might say, oh, it's a little bit over-exaggerating what you did there. But I think no. When you have two bands compared to each other and both bands play the same song, the same set with the same audio quality, with the same volumes, with the same guitar, the same gear and that kind of stuff. And there's one band who plays the songs to 80% perfect and then the other band is playing those songs maybe to just 50 or 60% perfect. Maybe there's a lot of stuff where the listener really can't describe okay what's going on here. Maybe you really don't notice if there's uh, one chord is wrong or some open strings and not everything is locked and tight. 
But when you compare those bands, I will assume that the listener always will say that the one band that played everything 80% perfectly will sound better than the one band that only played 50% correctly. Let's go for example into a different music genre. Let's go for example into funk music and check out the band Fearless Flyers. Why are they so tight? Why are they so locked together? Because everyone has practiced the shit out of this stuff. I assume that everyone has an individual tightness and bringing this individual tightness together it creates this yeah massive melting pot of great musicians who are tight as hell. And the more you can practice your individual tightness, your cleanness on guitar, is there some, especially on heavy metal riffing, is there some, yeah, some strings, some open strings that are ringing along which shouldn't be there, is everything nice and clean, is something sloppy, do you maybe know some fingerings not yet and you have to overthink everything and then playing everything wrong, all those kind of stuff you can work against it by practicing with the right method and therefore I would say let's check out the first chapter after this little intro talk here about okay how I practice some really really hard and heavy riffs. Here we go. I have a five-way practice system which I not only do for rhythm playing but I also do it for lead guitar playing for example and you can take those five approaches and what I did for example is I set approach number one on day number one of the week, approach number two on day number two, on day number three so I have some variations every day when I'm practicing on my practice routine. During the preparation for the Eternities End Tour I did all five approaches every day but there I took the time I really said okay I need to practice this kind of stuff at least five hours a day maybe eight hours a day I totally paused with all kind of other projects and only focused on eternities and you don't have to do this if guitar playing is just your hobby it's totally fine to do it like for half an hour every day but I will guarantee you if you're doing it half or half an hour every day all five approaches separate on each day it will definitely make an impact on the next rehearsal you have with your band so let us check out those five approaches the first one is the good old classical going from slow to fast for example the riff that you've just heard is on 120 BPM and I would say I start on 80 BPM and every five minutes I increase the tempo to the next 10 BPM. So for example when I start my practice session at 10 a.m. I would start on 80 BPM on 10 a.m. then five minutes later 10 5 it's 90 BPM then 100 BPM 110 and after 20 minutes I have 120 BPM and having the time spent from 40 BPM it's a lot 80, the difference between 80 BPM and 120 BPM it's quite a big distance but this is a really good method to get everything started maybe you will start to struggle on 100 BPM and then you maybe think okay why should I continue with 110 or 120 don't overthink it that way just try to push it a little bit more we're going to get more into the details and more into the really focusing on the struggles and the mistakes in the next approaches but this one is it's really good to get the engine going and to get the engine started. The next method is where we are focusing on all kinds of yeah, mistakes and little flaws that we have now playing when we want to increase the tempo. I call this nowadays the 7 out of 9 method. What I mean by that I take for example not the complete riff I take just a small snippet out of that riff going to talk about those small chunks later a little bit more it's really important for our practice routine but I'm going to take those small snippets like for example the first few notes of that riff then I record this on a tempo like 80 bpm or 90 bpm nine times when I've done it seven of nine times correctly I can go on with the tempo Recording yourself is really important because all the analytics that you can do after you've recorded yourself this is pure gold, this is really important. When we are practicing something you cannot always focus on all aspects of guitar playing. There's a lot of stuff that you don't hear because yeah, you maybe focus on the right fingering or the right hand or you maybe even focus at all and just watching staring at the screen and watching some soccer, some foosball or what not. 
I highly recommend to not only record yourself but also to slow it down so you really can hear okay, is everything, every note tight. Has every note the same length or is it more like like this for example, a little bit over exaggerating here right now. Yes, yeah, slowing everything down and then really listening to every note, every bits and pieces, and really checking on the grid for example of your DAW, okay, is everything locked on, is everything tight, is everything like a machine. When you've done it seven of nine times perfectly for that what you're focusing on, for example, timing, sound, phrasing, whatnot, then you can continue with the tempo. And then, for example, just 10 BPM or on the next day 10 BPM and then again 7 out of 9. And until you have reached a tempo where you can't record it 7 out of 9 times perfectly. When you have reached that tempo, then you are doing something which I call regressive practicing for progressive results. And that means you're slowing it down again. You're slowing it down up to the to that one spot where it started to struggle. 5 ppm down. Okay, 5 ppm still works. Practicing at 5 ppm, you have the 7 out of 9 correctly, then continue with increasing 2 ppm, 3 ppm, going little, little, tiny, itsy bitsy, tiny steps. But those steps are really important. And the more they are doing it, the bigger the steps are. Then you once you have reached 90 ppm, and then you can continue with 59, 100 ppm, 110, 125. So the, the steps are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because you create a bigger awareness of what you're doing. So this is what I call the seven of nine method and the regressive practicing for progressive results method. All right, we are continuing with the chunking method. Now, as I've mentioned, it's going to be really, really important for us to have those kind of little yeah, chunks from our riff. Not only to practice the riff in completely, but to practice the little parts of it. Because the moment where we start to struggle, maybe is sometimes deep inside of that riff. And we have to figure out, okay, where is this moment? Is it when I have to use a certain technique, string skipping, inside, outside picking, maybe certain fingering is really, really weird. And I have to focus and practice on that. You are only as good as the weakest link in your chain. So you have to focus on this weakest link and then the complete chain will get better and better because maybe there's really one spot, one tiny note or one tiny technique kind of yeah, going from one string to the next string, one kind of little aspect in that riff that always brings it down that all you that always that always makes your timing worse or you get slower because of that then try to practice this little chunk and then see this little chunk as the middle of the riff for example and then you're increasing the chunk on the round side so you're continuing it and on the other side so you start a little bit more early and then you are increasing the chunk more and more and more and more until you have for example one bar together and then when a riff is out of more bars, you're going to the next bar and there you're checking out, okay, where's, where's that one spot where I always be sloppy and lose my timing and all that kind of stuff. And then you're taking the same method, practice that one spot until it feels right and then continue to grow. And then combine bar one and bar two together and practice those and then bar three and so on so on. So see everything as a little puzzle pieces and you're sticking together all those kind of puzzles to get the bigger picture. Now this is the chunking method and the chunking method is also really important for our last method which is the bursting method. And here I have two approaches. I see this like a marathon runner, for example. When you are practicing a marathon or training for a marathon, you are on one way train the same distance, but try to get the distance faster and faster and faster, increase the tempo, or you will increase the distance, but stay with the tempo. And here I take the same kind of approaches. So for example, I take a little lick out of this riff and then I really push it to the limit and really go fast with it and go maybe faster than I can with it because it's important for us to practice something fast. We don't have to be afraid of a certain barrier that it will only work until this BPM or that BPM. This is fine for some focus stuff but sometimes we really need to shut down our brain, don't overthink everything and really try to push yourself, try to get to the limit and try to play this 
this idea, this lick as fast as you can. And then you're trying it faster and faster and faster. And then on the next day, for example, you're taking again this idea, start a little bit slower again. For example, you on th Tuesday, you have practiced it starting at 110 BPM, going to 120, 125, 130, 135, maybe even up to 140 BPM. And then the next day, you're taking the slick from the riff, starting again on maybe 100 BPM, and then you increase this little lick for, I don't know, five notes, six notes, up to the next point where you're feeling, okay, here is a new technique that I need to do or ten, that I acquire. And maybe this technique, I should focus on this technique individually, on this section individually. Maybe those are some good spots where you can categorize your riff. And then you increase the distance. And then on the next day, you can try to take the same distance on the next week, for example, you can try to take the same distance, but to increase the tempo again, and then burst it again a little bit more and really get up to your limit, to the end of it. All right, those were my five methods how I practice it. For example, when you want to make a practice routine or practice plan, you can do um, the start slow and get fast on day one. And then the seven out of nine on day two, for example. Then on day three, you are doing the chunking part and day four, you are doing the um, bursts. And then maybe on day five, the seven of nine again, or record the complete riff and really analyze the shit out of it and really make yourself notes, okay, where do I need to focus on the next week? And so you start with the next week and so on, so on, until the next rehearsal. And then in the next rehearsal, you will sit there and you will think, wow, I sound so tight and I sound so perfect and the band sounds so much better because now I can play this riff tight and correctly. Talking about riffs, let us check out the riff that I have here today for you from Call of the Valkyries of Eternity's End. Okay, first the riff slow, and then we're going to take a little bit kind of more deeper look into this riff. <laughs> We are in the key of E Fritchen dominant, A harmonic minor, something around that. It's a transition riff from uh, going from E minor to A minor. So it's based around the E dominant chord. This movement here. One rule I have for this riff is everything is ordinate picking. Doesn't matter how odd something feels. And maybe you can have some excuses where you're saying, no, no, it feels better for me when I start with an upward stroke or when I do double down strokes here and there. No, 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 no. Don't do this. Alternate picking gives you a definite control and routine over what you are playing. It may sound weird and wrong in the beginning, but believe me, in the end, play, for example, when you want to play something faster, you will lose a lot of control when you don't have the constant movement of alternate picking in your right hand. Doing stuff like two downstrokes in a row is something which will work slowly, but fast it will completely hinder you. So I really try to focus here on playing everything with straight alternate picking in this works a lot for me for a lot of riffs. Doesn't matter if Dream Theater riffs or maybe Megadeth. Megadeth is the best example because I play Megadeth songs live every month. So and there I realized I'm so much tighter and so much precise when I really work on my alternate picking. And this therefore, this riff is really perfectly because we have a lot of change between inside picking, outside picking, all those kind of weird stuff, pick angles, pick slanting, all those kind of techniques we have to be aware of this riff. And you can practice with this riff. And this is why this riff is so awesome to practice. Okay, first we are starting with this idea. Having the first string skip here, we will have a lot of string skips in this riff. Outlining this E major chord with the minus six in it. 
then we're going to F major like this and here we have the first passage where we have some really nasty inside picking downstroke upstroke downstroke and now we have to get from the D string back to the A string from a downstroke to an upstroke and this means we are stuck downstroke upstroke we are inside of those and this is but this is also really important, or maybe I, it's better if I'm showing it like this. Downstroke and then with an upstroke here. Downstroke, upstroke. And therefore, pick sanding is really important to know, okay, here I will use upward pick sanding and then here I will use downward pick sanding, two-way pick sanding, how it's called. And this is really, really good to practice because also the constant knowledge of where our downstrokes is gives us a little bit more kind of articulation in that rhythm. We can always yeah, articulate the downstrokes and the important subdivisions of a bar. Now this last note is really nasty, especially on this guitar. I'm not 100% yeah, satisfied and really, really happy with this guitar. Not with the neck or with the wood or something like that. Ivan is perfectly, it's because of the Fishman pickups. The Fishman pickups are really modern, but they are also really sensitive. And you have often something like this. This overnote ring here. I'm not doing something like a pull-off, I just release my pinky and instantly have that overtone, that, that pinch harmonic here. Not cool, not so cool. How can I work against it? Because it's also a good practice guitar because there's really, yeah, it's a nasty guitar and uh, a lot of stuff sound, uh, and you will hear a lot of mistakes on this guitar that you won't hear on other guitars. Well, here I try to mute with one my right hand, but this is in this situation not really possible because I want to play the G string and then go on the string below and I can't have the palm mute here. So I need my other fingers and do something like this. By putting or by resting the other fingers a little bit on the string, not pushing down, the uh, harmonic will disappear. The overtone is gone. So we have here. Okay, then comes the next section. It's from the uh, right hand. Really, really like the first section and also from the harmonic build-up. Then comes this idea here. And this is really interesting, especially for a right hand, because here we have a movement in three, but alternate picking is divided into two. So we have down, up, down on the D, G and B string. And then we want to start again on the D string and then we have up, down, up. So it's changing. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Down, up, down, up, down, up. And this is a really, really good exercise. Really good exercise for your cross picking and for your picking control in general to really get this alternate picking straight and really tight here and not do something like down, up, down, down, up, down, down. Then, yes, you have the same rhythm or the same picking direction every time you're repeating this phrase, but the chance of doing mistakes will increase by doing this when you increase the tempo because of the two downstrokes here you have to do a lot of you have to and you have to leave behind a lot of way to get from the b string downstroke to the d string downstroke to the end to the left from the last note of the downstroke to the first note of the downstroke so practice down up down up down up everything with cross picking and two way pick sending And then 
Christian, my other guitar player who writes all this kind of crazy shit, and he, by the way, I have to say is a master in writing crazy riffs. I mean, check out all the Obscura stuff that he's doing, and then of course, the all the Eternity's End kind of stuff that he's doing, and of course, a solo record. So if you want to have a source of really crazy elite guitar playing and also riff guitar playing, but still really, really great and cool songs, then check out the other stuff from my good friend Christian. Obscura, Alkaloid, and especially his solo records. He is playing this riff twice and I'm playing the harmony and the harmony now involves some really really crazy stretches in it. The harmony section starts like this. So again we have a lot of string skipping here going from the A string to the G string and with the D string in between that but also with inside picking really here keep your focus on the right hand that you always have the alternate picking really really straight no double pick direction no sweep picking no economy picking no hybrid picking everything was alternate picking. <laughs> Here's the nasty stretch. I could have gone to here, but for me, there's something where you can change something. I think in a horizontal way, you can change uh, to have kind of more like this figure here and not do the string skip because when I have to go here, I have to go with an upstroke from the D string to a downstroke on the B string and this was a little bit unnecessary, so I rather do the big stretch. Then goes the next section. Going here, outlining really, really cool the E dominant kind of sound. And then again, we have the groupings of three but this time a little bit higher up the fretboard, yeah. And what we have here harmonically wise is A minor, G sharp diminished, resolving back to A. So this is basically the riff. If you want to practice this riff with a chunking system, for example, I recommend chunks like this. First chunk, then the second, sorry, the third, and the fourth. The same goes for the harmony, of course. And then connect those chunks likely at more and more puzzle pieces. So I hope you liked this little video about riffing here. Please check out my band Eternity's End and our latest record Embers of War. You can buy this for example on our Bandcamp page. Feel free to subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment. This is the way how you can yeah, support this channel. Check out the then of speed picking, my online speed picking course. Link is in the description box. I hope I'm going to see you in my next video. Cheers so far and stay progress.